used China as his excuse. So we want to talk about what we're going to do. Um, and hey, Bernadette, are you raising your hand? No, I'm fixing the light above me. <laughs> I want you to be able to see me in all my beauty. Oh, yes, we can't see all your beauty. <laughs> Especially that light's just brightening up your eyes. Well, there's a light right up here and I was adjusting it. <laughs> so, hi, Barbara. Um, so, um, you know, we're gonna, Carly and Madsen are gonna talk about how we're gonna confront this, but we also wanna hear your ideas and your feedback and where you see it's working or not. I mean, I would say what's hardest for us right now is that when there's a budget like this, we're used to being in every hearing, we're used to taking our messages, we're used to disrupting the stupid, you know, droll of nonsense that comes out of Congress and we can't get in. Um, and, you know, we know that that's where we're most effective is being able to kind of what I say, pull the pants down a power while they're trying to, you know, tell us another story and, and live behind their narrative. So what we're really trying to figure out here is, you know, where can we disrupt this narrative in a really provocative um, way, you know, which is the code pink way. How do we disrupt the narrative and, and talk about what's really happening that they're not telling you? Yes, the camera's from here. It's a oh. picture of you. Hi, That's Gil. Um, maybe, Gil, if you could mute, just um, that would be awesome. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so, you know, a, a big part of what we're trying to figure out right now is because we can't go where the cameras are, because we can't be in the in the halls of Congress, in the back of a, Cong a congressional hearing, how are we going to disrupt this narrative? And I, I want to say, also, we've never, the media has never been so bad. The media is really in the pockets of power. It is only working for the status quo. It is only working for corporations and the rich. And it is not carrying our stories at all. And like right now we're working very hard. I mean, Medea is writing three pieces a week, um, very powerful pieces each week. And they're not getting past, um, you know, left media. And even left media can be pretty depressing. I mean, the fact that we saw Amy Goodman on Democracy Now! parroting the State Department messages, narratives um, around China was pretty shocking. Um, we did um, let her know that, and she did put VJ Prashad on. We said, you, you know, if you're going to do that, you've got to you've got to put somebody else on. And she did put him on for 40 minutes to debunk what she'd already done. So, you know, we, what we find is that we're just, you know, daily having to figure out how we get even marginally in the way of really incredible narratives that are pushing for more war. And the fact that it, there's a, a, an increase in the Pentagon and the excuse is China. When China is not our enemy, when the aggressor is the US, when you, you know China has done nothing for us to fear and we've done everything for them to fear and they're gonna have to react to what we're doing to them. They are going to have to do things. Um, and we're forcing, you know, and the, you know, war with China, US war with China is something the entire world does not want. Just like <laughs> the people of the world and 12 million in the street didn't want the war with Iraq. And here we are with the troops coming home from Afghanistan after trillions of dollars and lives lost. Still, still, um, Biden thinks that war is the answer. So first, I want to um, turn this over to Carly. We'll have plenty of time for your question and comments to talk about how we're responding to the budget. Carly runs our um, Divest campaign, as I said earlier. She's a rock star organizer. She has a fantastic team. And so Carly, first we'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks Jody, and, and hi everyone. It's really great to see you here uh, today. And um, like Jody said, you know, hopefully sometime soon we'll all be in the same room, uh, not just over Zoom together. Um, but so I'm gonna start off, I actually have a um, presentation. So like Jody said, I wanted to kind of go over um, now that uh, Joe Biden's proposed Pentagon budget has been released, 
Um, let's let's review like what the Pentagon budget um, actually is compared to other countries and how we can respond to it. And then, like Jody said, um, I'd love to have a conversation with everyone here about um, some of the things that we can do together. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, let me just make sure it's full screen. All right, wonderful. So I'm gonna go through this with everyone now and we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, so I'm gonna go over our defund the Pentagon or, or reduce the Pentagon budget and invest in human needs um, campaign. So first, right, um, I wanted to go over and remind ourselves um, really the current levels of US military spending and how that compares to the rest of the world. Um, I don't think we can repeat this enough, right? Like Jody said in the media, when we saw um, Joe Biden's proposal for an increase to the Pentagon budget, I think we should always have in mind and always be responding by telling people, do you know that the US spends currently more than the next 10 nations combined on our military budget. And even if we shaved off 250 billion from that budget today, we'd spend more than the rest of the world combined, right? So you see the rest of the world, other than those 10 countries, spend less than, even if we uh, were able to shave off 250 billion from our budget, right? So we should keep that in mind whenever we're talking to people about reducing the Pentagon budget um, and hearing them resist, right? Another thing that I think is really important, right, within the United States is how much of our federal budget discretionary spending, so the spending that Congress decides every year, how much of that is dominated by the military as well, right? And we look at this uh, pie chart and we see we spend well over half of our, um, our discretionary spending on the military. And importantly, look what that leaves for the rest of really important social programs, right? Um, for housing, for healthcare, for veterans benefits, for education, they get a tiny slice of this pie. And if we reduce this Pentagon budget, look how much more of the pie would they would get, right? So I think it's also important that we talk about trade-offs um, in terms of spending, right? When we're spending so much on the military budget. Um, and so today we sort of wanted to talk a little bit about um, our Divest from the War Machine campaign and defund the Pentagon campaign and how they can really work together to um, help us defund the Pentagon and uh, reduce funding for war um, in our country and around the world. So our Divest from the War Machine campaign really operates on this very simple premise, which is if we're going to end war, we really have to stop allowing companies to profit from war. And one key aspect of that campaign involves understanding how war profiteers, including companies that produce weapons, exert so much influence over our politicians, right? Um, uh, you know, of course, right, what's represented on the slide doesn't capture all of the ways our politicians are heavily influenced, and it certainly doesn't capture the ways in which our media is also influenced. But we, we know that weapons manufacturers and quote unquote defense contractors use their huge profits to fund the campaign of politicians and then politicians vote to extend existing wars, right? They, they vote to engage in new conflicts. And then every year they vote to increase the Pentagon budget. So that's a really important um, key, piece to keep in mind as we have this conversation as well. And we'll come back to this. Um, but I also wanted to continue to discuss our Pentagon budget and sort of contextualize it for people. So in 2021, we're gonna spend $740 billion on the Pentagon budget and half of that goes directly into the pockets of private quote unquote defense contractors. Um, and you know this represents a, a growing trend since 2001, since the so-called war on terror in spending on private contractors, right? So our military is more and more become privatized as well. Um, another thing that I think is really important that people, um, we, we can talk about as well is that we spend so much money on our military and so much on the Pentagon budget is dedicated to maintaining and creating new weapons that the Pentagon can then send those excess weapons into our own communities through the 1033 program. And we saw that over the summer and we're seeing that now when people are um, horrified that our police departments look like occupying militaries, it's because of this program, right? And it's because of um, how much funding our Pentagon budget gets every year. 
So I think these numbers are really shocking, but also at the end of the day, demonstrate, you know, what our priorities are as a nation. And as we discussed, right, the Pentagon budget is discretionary spending. And we are every year Congress is choosing to spend all of this money on the military at the expense of social programs, right? So I think this is a perfect representation of what we're losing when we spend on the military, right? Just 10% could end homelessness in the United States. 20% of the Pentagon budget could make public college tuition free. 50% of the Pentagon budget, which would still leave us as one of the top um, nations on military spending around the world, could end world hunger by 2030, right? So really, um, our, our spending on the military budget is a choice, and it's something that our, our Congress people make every year. And so we're going to talk about, like, how do we hold them accountable, and what are we going to do as Code Pink as well? Um, but I also just wanted to, since, since Earth Day is coming up, I wanted to touch on a few issues that I think are also really important um, when we're discussing the Pentagon budget and reducing it. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the Pentagon budget is and can be an intersectional issue that we can organize around, right? And um, I sort of want to touch on a few of those issues that we can also talk about when we're talking to people in our local communities about the impact that the Pentagon budget actually has on them. So one, um, and I think this is one of the largest myths we hear whenever we talk about um, reducing the Pentagon budget is that is the idea that high levels of Pentagon spending is justified because doing so creates jobs, right? I'm sure many people have heard this. Um, the media repeats it all the time, like Jody uh, said. And I think we all need to be aware of this study that was done by the Cost of War Project that shows very clearly, right, that while it's true, right, I mean, spending on any government ag agency will create jobs, we have to understand that within the context of other spending, right? We, we have to understand that almost any government AG would, agency would create jobs, but what if we looked at um, spending on other government agencies, right? What if we spent this money on clean energy, healthcare, education, and dollar for dollar, we would have more jobs and not only more jobs in our society, but jobs that are better for our society, better for the planet, better for the world. So I, this is a really important point for us to make. Um, and I think um, something that dovetails really well with that is the Pentagon budget and climate change, right? Um, we have to always talk about the Pentagon budget within the context of the ongoing climate crisis and climate change um, generally. So I think it's really important um, as anti-war activists that we're able to communicate and distinguish between several ar arguments that are being made right now about climate change in the Pentagon budget, right? So on the one hand, our allies at the National Priorities Project, Institute for Policy Studies, did an incredible series and studies showing the connection between spending on the Pentagon budget and climate change and showing that, you know, uh, the, the connection between them is very clear, right? Militarism and the climate crisis are, are deeply intertwined and mutually reinforcing. Um, the military itself is a huge polluter and is often deployed to sustain the very extractive industries like oil um, that destabilize our climate, right? So in turn, right, this climate chaos that the Pentagon itself is, is contributing to um, leads to massive displacement, militarized borders, and the prospect of further conflict, right? So not only is the Pentagon as an institution um, something that we have to focus on as um, something that's emitting greenhouse gases, it's also driving some of the worst parts of the climate crisis itself, right? And this is important. But um, like uh, Jody alluded to, in the media, even media we might be amenable to at some points, there's another sort of um, thread that's happening showing that um, there's sort of concerted effort to use language about the climate crisis to sort of green the US military and in the process sort of shore up support for US militarism by really greenwashing the US military, right? You can see these, um, these two headlines, how the Department of Defense could win the war on climate change. Uh, 14 weird ways the US military is becoming a clean green fighting machine. 
right? I mean, these headlines are really disturbing. And like I said, we have to be able to speak back to this um, concerted effort to really greenwash the military. So two things I think we should keep in mind, right? Um, the US military itself is the single largest institutional emitter of carbon in the world. And two, spending $740 billion on the Pentagon budget means we're not using that money to address you know, our actual threat to national security, which is a global climate crisis um, that will require international so solidarity to adequate, adequately address, right? We can't keep investing in militarism as the solution to these problems. So we have to, we have to understand that um, as a movement. Um, so that kind of leads us to uh, the section about what, what can we do, right? What are some of the things that we're working at Code Pink? And then also, um, what are some things we can discuss together here today? So, you know, as a reminder, when I talked earlier, we talked a little bit about this connection between politicians taking campaign cash from these companies and their uh, votes to increase Pentagon spending. Uh, well, uh, one of our partners at the Security Policy Reform Institute, which is a grassroots think tank, did a study and showed what all of us know, right, but um, is now available in study form, that there's a direct correlation between contributions from the, the defense industry and voting to maintain or increase military spending, right? Um, which is one of the reasons why it's so important that we're, we're taking our Code Clean pledge to ask Congress people to commit to stop taking campaign contributions from weapons manufacturers and the NRA to directly to our Congress people to start this conversation and get them on the record about why they um, won't uh, prevent this, this very extreme and very clear conflict of interest, right? Um, and here's the pledge here that you can see. Um, it's very simple. It's just asking your representatives to, to refuse campaign contributions from the top five weapons manufacturers in the world, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, Boeing, and General Dynamics. Um, it lays out very clearly, right? I'm, I'm somebody who's making decisions about national security and also the Pentagon budget that I have to make every year. So it's a clear conflict of interest that I'm taking money from the companies that themselves will benefit from. Um, and then another thing that we're talking to our representatives about that I wanted to mention here is we are asking our representatives to join the Congressional Defense Spending Reduction Caucus, which you know is kind of a mouthful, but um, the Congressional Defense Spending Reduction Caucus was started by two of um, some of our best champions in Congress, uh, Mark Pocan and Barbara Lee, um, to really start building power in Congress to reduce the Pentagon budget, right? And currently there are approximately 22 Congress people who are part of this caucus who are working to convince their colleagues to reduce the Pentagon budget. And um, when we end, when I end this presentation, I'm happy to put the, um, the actual names of those Congress people in the chat and we can look at who's there um, and who's not and who we might wanna talk about um, asking and pressuring. Another thing that we're doing right now um, is that like Jody said, right, Joe Biden just released his Pentagon budget proposal, increasing it um, to $753 billion a year. And now that Joe Biden has released this proposal, it's now Congress's turn to start deliberating on the Pentagon budget. And this is like the really crucial time that we need to start talking to our Congress people and really explaining to them not only why we need to deep on the Pentagon, but also how that will affect our local communities. And we can talk about that as well. And in order to sort of practice that together, talk about that and really start to get this into, um, you know, the, the, our local communities and the minds of everyone around us, we are also hosting this Thursday, um, a War Is Not Green op-ed writing workshop on Earth Day, um, which is gonna be sort of an, an interactive workshop where people can come together we're going to talk about um, how war is not green, our talking points around defending the Pentagon, and then really practical tips like how can, you can actually uh, place an op-ed in your local newspaper. And everyone here is invited to that. Um, so that was that was quite a bit. So I'm going to pause and stop here, and then I think we can pause for questions and and have a discussion now.
not sure who's, am I, should I moderate the discussion or? Um, does okay. everyone want to um, ask Carly questions now or do you want to go on to Madison's and then we can ask questions after? Looks like we're ready to go. Cool. All right. Well, so, um, so there you've got what we're doing, but I think this, there's a really important part of this and it's that they're blaming the increase on the aggression of China. And um, Madison is now running our China is not our enemy campaign. She's amazing. We, it's really great that she's part of the Kud Pink team. We're all very excited. She's just coming off of a webinar she did with three other young women. Um, and so, you know, the thing about China is, um, and we really learned that from this campaign the last year, is the US is really dumb about China. And um, the, the xenophobia and the racism that existed at the heart of the US, it plays out with um, what's happening here. And we're watching, I mean, the reason I leapt onto it like last April was it looked exactly like Iraq to me. The propaganda that was coming out, the way it was coming out, how every day the same like 75 stories across the entire media, it was a parroting of the exact same words. And then you know it's coming out of the State Department. So as we've gotten into this deeper, it's darker, it's older, it's longer, and it smells. So um, let's have Madison make us all smarter about China. Thank you, Madison. Thank you, Jody, um, and thanks for having me. This is my first Peacemaker Salon, so it's exciting to be able to see some of your faces and engage with you. Um, I just started um, recently last month as the China is Not Our Enemy campaign coordinator for Code Pink. Uh, my name is Madison Tang, so you might be seeing more of me. Um, and I'm going to give a little info on, yeah, where the U.S. stands with China, especially in terms of this new budget proposal that Carly's talking about, um, that beautiful presentation with so many good facts and comparisons. Um, and I'm gonna let you know some of the things that we've been doing with our campaign, which um, as Jody said, started really um, to dismantle the anti-China rhetoric and propaganda led by the US and um, to kind of challenge justifications for more war, which we know are usually falsified and not or distorted at some in some level. Um, so I'm going to share screen. Um, can everyone see? Want to make yes, sure. I can see okay. it. Thank you. Yeah, I started once without it, so got to make sure. Um, so you can always find our info on codepink.org slash China. There's also a YouTube playlist on our YouTube for Code Pink where you can see all our webinars. Um, so these are some recent quotes from this current administration. Um, Biden's first press conference, um, he literally vowed to prevent China from surpassing the US um, and becoming the most powerful country in the world. So he made this a point of his presidency that he will not let it happen. Um, but we know from projections um, that China is poised to surpass the US as an economic power within the next five, 10 years. So how is he going to prevent this? Um, we're seeing all these calls for war, um, economic blockades, sanctions, et cetera. And then we have Blinken where he met um, Chinese officials like Wang Yi at Alaska. It was a pretty heated discussion, a lot of US diplomacy grandstanding really, um, and the Chinese officials kind of trying to maintain their right to sovereignty. That was mostly the tone of it. So he said that China threatens the rules-based order that maintains global stability. Um, and this rules-based order is being thrown around a lot. It's interesting to consider what a rules-based order just to the US looks like, knowing that the US doesn't always even follow international law when it comes to the UN and human rights. Um, also knowing that 
There are other allies of the US in East Asia, like Japan, um, where they're currently dumping nuclear waste into the ocean. And the US has officially come out on the um, White House website to say that they approve of this. Um, what's the difference in Japan and China? Well, Japan has been our ally for longer, right? And Japan has an imperialist background. They're much more aligned with the US's mode of society. Um, so this is a little background on some documents that have been used over the years to shape our actual US defense and foreign policy. Um, so there is this 1992 document and both of these documents were kind of written by these neoconservative protégés of this individual, Andrew Marshall. Um, the 1992 document, at first when it came out, um, was kind of an embarrassing like leakage and it was seen as having like a lot of hubris. You can see that it announces the US as the world's only remaining superpower following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, its main objective is to retain that status. So there's a lot of language around US maintenance of global supremacy, global hegemony, um, and a lot of like preemptive um, military actions to prevent another world power from rising or uh, accumulating resources. We have the Rebuilding America's Defense document that was a little later in 2000. Um, and it specifically names China. So there's this pivot gradually from the Soviet Union to China as the next greatest threat in terms of being a socialist power and an alternative um, to US um, ideology. Um, says raising US military strength in East Asia is the key to coping with the rise of China to great power status. Um, and then we had with um, Hillary Clinton, primarily under the Obama administration, and then al also into Obama and Biden, the pivot to Asia. Um, so it came out when Hillary uh, published an article on foreign policy, and uh, she framed it as, sorry, I skipped one slide, so we're gonna be here. Um, Hillary Clinton framed it as a positive pivot. Um, after the US had this strategic focus on um, Southwest Asian, North African or Middle East countries, um, which was also following that same doctrine of like preventing other world powers from rising and maintaining global dominance, because we know that a lot of Middle East wars for the US were about having a monopoly on oil as a resource. Um, so following that, there was this pivot to the Pacific theater um, and Hillary framed it as positive. This is gonna help us with trade. It's gonna help our economy, recession, et cetera. Um, but there was some underlying um, aspects to that. Um, but first this last bullet is just to reference um, why the Asia Pacific region is so important historically and today. Um, there is an understanding in uh, theories around geopolitics that the Eurasian landmass, um, including China and Russia, have this world island um, that has contains most of the world's resources, population, and therefore if there's a control over that area by one power, um, that would give you the key to global domination. And so this is the kind of less public aspects of the pivot to Asia. Um, it's framed a lot as positive, but we know today that there are a lot of negative underpinnings. 60% um, of US naval capacity was transferred to the Western Pacific region at this time, as when Hillary announced this. Um, China was encircled with 400 military bases by the US, including like missile systems. And then this building and shoring up of alliances started and Today, we have it with the Quad Alliance, um, nations that are loyal to the US and um, willing to form an allyship against China. Um, and we also have economic warfare through the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which basically created an economic block that isolated China and gave the US um, hegemony over, over um, economics and trade. So this is just showing those military bases what how the US has surrounded the nation of China, which is right in the center. Um, so there's a uh, naval as well as on the Western side of China where the border of China um, 
there's parts that border with Afghanistan, Pakistan. So we have access to oil over there that the US is eyeing heavily and they see the China border as a threat in that way. As opposed to, if we look at the United States, China doesn't have any military bases surrounding the borders of the United States. So this uh, idea of China as the first aggressor, it's really projection, it's really distorted. Um, it keeps getting repeated um, and that has power as we know, but it's not really reality. So going to today now, after a little bit of that history, um, the US has stated in defense planning documents that it is engaging in a hybrid warfare to present, prevent the rise of China. So this is kind of consistent with modern um, transitions in war and adaptations. It's involving not just um, manpower on the ground, but we know now there's a shift to drones and more um, remote war, but there's also economic warfare, like I said, with the TPP or with the dozens of sanctions recently that the US um, imposed unilaterally on Chinese officials, um, just like it has been doing to other nations um, illegally, like Venezuela and Iran. Um, legal warfare, diplomatic warfare, military brinkmanship, meaning um, kind of pushing the threat of war, um, pushing that boundary by uh, doing daily exercises in the Pacific. You can see um, the Indo-Pacific Command, even on Twitter, kind of brags about the exercises they're doing daily, which are provocations and acts of war in themselves because they do injure um, Pacific Islanders and Asians um, by accidents, et cetera. Civil subversion, we'll talk about that a little later. Um, there's attempts to kind of balkanize China and um, disrupt internally. Um, academic warfare, uh, in US universities, there is a huge repression campaign against Chinese um, international students as well as Chinese American students. Um, there's suppression of the Confucius Institute, which is essentially a partner program that Chinese institutes have with US institutes to help with Chinese language learning. And um, there's also information warfare. And information warfare is the biggest one that is being kind of waged right now. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then you can see kind of the geostrategic focus on the Indo-Pacific um, and the Quad Alliance, um, the US, Japan, Australia, and India. And it's significant that India has joined because India has had a non-aligned policy um, for a long time. Um, we already saw this a little bit with Carly's presentation, but just to kind of see specifically um, the US versus China and that disparity in um, defense spending and how um, as large of a country as China is and as much imperialist aggression that China has seen in its history, um, it's kind of amazing that China even had a revolution considering that imperial oppression um, and like instigation and et cetera. Um, they do have a military and they are spending on military including nuclear weapons, um, but is not nearly as much as the US and is not being used in nearly the same way to threaten uh, aggression. China is more interested in multilateral cooperation to kind of help develop all of the world um, rather than like a zero sum policy of if one country is doing better then the other country must be losing. Um, and this is to see kind of the regions of China that are seen by the West as vulnerable. You can see like it's a huge country um, and we have North Korea up at the top right, um, Hong Kong, which we've heard a lot about. Um, we know because it was a British imperial outpost, there's a very different um, ideology of residents there. And then we have the South China Sea, which the US is all over right now with um, naval capacity to the extent that they're kind of limiting the economic um, imports and exports of China. Um, we have Xinjiang on the Western side, like I said, parts of it border Afghanistan. Um, and that's kind of the doorway to Central Europe um, and lots of um, trade and opportunities that China has been cut off from kind of since the first Silk Road. Um, Taiwan, 
and I'll keep moving. So in response to the US's attempts to blockade um, trade and imports and exports, including oil um, in the South China Sea, um, President Xi Jinping has devised this uh, very uh, impressive uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which is known as the New Silk Road. Um, and this is a huge infrastructure development and investment initiative going from East Asia to Europe. Um, and like I said, it's partially in response to that naval chokehold so that they can diversify their energy sources and their trade routes, build dialogue with other countries. Um, and it's two pronged. There's the overland part going west through Xinjiang and then there's the maritime Silk Road, which I'll show a map of later, which would kind of avoid the naval blockade that the US has. Um, and it includes building infrastructure like railways, energy pipelines, highways, um, border crossings, et cetera. Um, these projects are built using low interest loans. Um, the China generally does not engage with the IMF, um, World Bank or any of those. Um, they prefer to use market rate loans that are fairer. And about 140 countries have signed on so far. It's expected most global South nations will. Um, the reason for this is that Global South nations are struggling because of the US's deadly sanctions, um, especially during the pandemic. Um, places like Iran can't even get medical supplies, COVID tests, doctors, and China has been one of the nations kind of helping with that chasm by sending doctors and medical supplies to places like Iran. Um, so really this Belt Road Initiative would undermine the US's deadly unilateral sanction power, and it would create this new era of interdependence, solidarity, trade and development with third world nations. You can see why that would be threatening to the US in a way that's not being publicly stated. So you can see the Silk Road here. Um, the orange highlighted areas are the um, overland routes. The blue highlighted areas at the bottom are the maritime routes. Um, and there are gas and oil pipelines, railroads, et cetera. And it would connect Central Europe, Western Asia in pretty phenomenal ways and help a lot of these countries that are developing, including African countries. The maritime route would touch on Djibouti in Africa. Um, and China is currently helping with infrastructure development in many areas of Africa. Again, with market rate loans, some of the loans have even been deferred um, and this is huge because uh, other nations have not invested in the infrastructure of Africa. Um, Western European and American colonialism has just extracted wealth, resources, labor, and not done anything to invest um, in the continent and nations of Africa. So you can see a closer look of the Silk Road, the maritime route in the bottom right here. and. Um, the black and red points is really this route that's gonna help avoid some of the blockade. One of the blockades is on the Strait of Malacca, which is um, right below the word of Thailand, that little narrow area there. So China's trying to avoid that. Um, and you can see in the top left, this region of the free and open quote Indo-Pacific was really first introduced um, under Trump and it's really in response to um, this potential Belt Road Initiative. So free is kind of a relative term here. So more on how the US is responding. Um, this rebalance of power is a huge threat to US global supremacy. Um, a little more on how the Department of Defense and Trump uses this term Indo-Pacific and how that's kind of helped with the shoring up of alliances. Um, and we also have sanctioning, explicit sanctioning by the US of Chinese companies that are helping with the construction. So there's some targeted reactions. And we also have the US Senate is proposing at least a million of dollars in funding, um, probably a lot more to support media, um, to raise awareness of quote, the negative impact of activities related to the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, which has clear bias because there are a lot of positive impacts as well. Everything has pros and cons, but 
we wouldn't have so many global south and third world nations um, interested in this development project if it wasn't going to help their economy, wasn't going to improve jobs, help its people, and kind of like limit the negative um, oppression that the US has imposed on them. And I told you I was going to touch a little more on the information war leg of the hybrid war. Um, and that's really what Jody was also referencing in the beginning of um, this event that this is a key element right now of the US's strategy. Um, and that includes Western mainstream media. You've probably seen all of the anti China um, journalism in places like the Washington Post, um, New York Times. Um, and these are all the same mainstream media that after the rise in anti-Asian violence, after the Atlanta shootings of six Asian women came out to um, claim they were innocent and like change their narrative a little bit when they were stoking this violence um, prior to it. We also have the White House and then social media generally um, where we see this information war and propaganda against China to manufacture consent for war. So this has been um, part of US war policy and defense policy um, with the National Endowment for Democracy, um, which you've probably heard of. Um, it's funded by USAID. Um, and that's how we've kind of developed our more modern ways of justifying and manufacturing consent for war um, is often by weaponizing human rights or uh, other internal issues in a country to justify interventionism, just like we did in Iraq. Um, and there's this quote from William Bloom, a lot of what we do today was done covertly 25 years ago by the CIA. So there's this hubris of neoconservatives um, that they don't even need to uh, spell things out anymore, like, or, or they don't even need to uh, hide everything anymore. They can just find some kind of excuse and the public will eat it up and the public in the United States is okay with it because there's this mindless uh, acceptance of endless wars. Um, so I'll say a little bit about this, um, but there's a lot more information around um, the topic of destabilization in Xinjiang. Can't really get into all the details, but I'm happy to talk about it later or um, answer questions. But we know that uh, following the money is usually one of the most productive and efficient ways to figure out if a destabilization effort is, at, is in play. Um, so as part of the strategy to crush China's ambition, the US government has pumped 27 million into opposition movements through the NED. So you can find this money online if you um, do a little research on the NED. Much of that funding is going to Hong Kong protesters um, who we also know have allied and spoken and met up with um, heavily conservative leaders like Marco Rubio in the US. Um, and 2.3 million has gone to uh, Hong Kong, as well as to the East Turkestan separatist movement in Xinjiang. Um, and prior to the uh, re-education in Xinjiang, there were CIA attempts to radicalize Uyghur Muslim populations in the autonomous Xinjiang region of Western China. Um, and this is part of those weak points of China, that map I showed earlier, where um, all those places are ways to kind of balkanized China the same way the US did, attempted to do for the Soviet Union. Um, it's the same strategy adopted also in Afghanistan, Chechnya, Libya, Egypt, Syria, and many more nations. The important thing is that we're paying attention um, as US citizens who are in some ways complicit in this, that we're holding um, our officials accountable and that we're challenging these narratives. And this is just a way to look at um, the voices of Muslim nations and people and how you can see all of the blue nations are the ones condemning China for its um, treatment of Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang um, and how it's mostly US NATO. And the red nations are Muslim majority nations, a lot of them, the black outlined nations uh, around North Africa in that region are part of the Organization of Islam Islamic Cooperation. Um, so all these red nations have visited Xinjiang, the autonomous region, and they've come back after these delegations saying they approve of the way China's dealing with re-education of extremists and they do see multi-ethnic and multi-religious inclusivity being fostered. Um, so it's just important to, to keep that in mind. And then last but not least, 
the budget proposal, which is the most pressing thing right now. Um, there's an increase of 1.6% from Trump's administration. And the language of the budget proposal is all justifying this increase in spending um, with the threat of China explicitly. Um, China is stated as the top challenge to the Pentagon. And this is especially dangerous because there's bipartisan consensus over this. Um, even the squad members like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has consistently voted um, on conservative legislation, Republican legislation um, to increase aggression against China, economic and military, et cetera. Um, so that makes it dangerous. Um, we know that there's not bi bipartisan consensus on everything right now, but this is uh, an issue where we have the threat of nuclear war. Um, it's definitely something we want to be challenging. Um, and part of the budget proposal includes specifically the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, um, which would give $4.7 billion in the next year to the Indo-Pacific Command in the Western Pacific region, um, specifically to um, build up military capacity against China and to increase that aggression. This is double what the Indo-Pacific Command had last year. Um, so it's a huge increase and it's a huge focus on specifically Pacific, the Pacific region and Asia. Um, when we talk about the threat of nuclear war, um, it expands this conflict far beyond the US and China to the entire world, our entire species and non-human life, planetary collapse, um, which is not something we can really entertain and we should not be, we should be pushing for cooperation. Um, but looking at nuclear policy, um, the US has many thousands more, five, six thousands more, um, nuclear weapons than China does, although China does have nuclear weapons and, you know, like issues with China aside, um, they shouldn't be justification for war. Um, but the US doesn't have a no first use policy while China does. Again, who is the aggressor here? We can look at reality rather than mainstream media distortions. Um, and the US has even explicitly prepared for nuclear war with China, um, threatening intolerable damage, et cetera. So when we're looking at this budget um, and we're looking at this prime justification of China as the reason for a budget increase, I think there's a big opportunity here to challenge that and to challenge why the US is framing China as an aggressor. Um, in China's defense and foreign policy strategy, it actually welcomes a multilateral approach. We can see that through its relationships with global South nations and developing nations. Um, Sure, it benefits China to develop relationships with these nations because there's a more of a coalition against um, US imperialism, but also China is doing this because it believes in other nations developing. Um, China itself had a massive development. Um, just recently, it's alleviated uh, absolute poverty, lifted 800 million people out of poverty um, through state policies. So China believes in other nations being able to do that as well without the burden of US imperialism and aggression on their backs. Um, so we're at the China is not our enemy campaign really advocating for cooperation, not conflict, um, especially with China. Um, and China is such a large and powerful nation that we should be cooperating on things, especially like climate change mitigation, vaccine distribution, which we already know uh, the US is not cooperating with other nations on due to patents and profit and global nuclear disarmament. And these are things that the US should be working with China on. China is willing to work on these things um, and have diplomacy with the US on. It's kind of in our power right now to challenge this narrative, like I said. And you can see from that just how the push for China, war against China is not new. There's this historical building um, of that narrative since the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, and that war with China is also already beginning at home within US borders when we see this spike in anti-Asian violence, a lot of it being associated with perpetrators specifically stating that they did it because of anger at quote, the CCP or the Chinese government. There's this conflation of the government with all Asian and Asian American people. So this 
aggression and provocation of war has real embodied consequences that's affecting Asians and Asian Americans in the US and all over the world, especially the Pacific right now. Um, and we have a couple petitions that I can link later. One of them right now is um, to ask the Biden administration to um, stop constructing a new marine base in Hinoko, Okinawa, where indigenous Okinawans have been resisting for years. And one of them is to tell Secretary Blinken to stop anti-Asian hate abroad and at home by reducing this aggressive narrative against China. Thank you, Madison. So does everybody feel smarter? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Aren't we? Uh, yeah, right, Bernadette, I know. Um, but thank you, Alex. Um, so yes, we're really lucky to have um, Madison. And, um, you know, I think one of the things um, that we need to remember is that China was the poorest country in the world, one of the 10 poorest countries in the world in 1970. So, you know, to not look at what has happened that, you know, 1.4 billion people, there's not a homeless person in China, like that a government can create the capacity for um, that level of support for people while we live in a country that is failing at everything, failing at everything. And they're trying to say, we're the top dog and we need to be at the top of the table and we need to rule at a time when we have no idea what the effects of this COVID year have been to the you know, 80 poorest countries that don't even have vaccines yet. We have no idea, but I can promise you it is not pretty. And we have to be cooperating right now. And we know we've been through 20 years of war, trillions of dollars, millions of lives, the destabilization of the entire Middle East. This is, this is not, this is the de entire destabilization of the world and an existential threat for, you know, a couple of nuclear weapons drop, we have a nuclear winter, nothing grows, we're all dead. So, you know, the fact that we're being distracted by other things and that they're, that the US is still the aggressor in here um, is problematic. And I, I wanna tell you how problematic that Kerry enters the White House and says to the White House, we have to be cooperating with China. And you hear about the fights they're having in the White House and what does he end up saying? We have to cooperate with China on, on the environment, but we still need to fight with China. You know, he even got turned. So our job is big. Um, and a lot of it is just education. The campaign on China is targeted at progressives and the left. I mean, while we were sitting here, a sum of us email just came talking about protecting the Uyghurs and I just had to write them a scathing email. Who are you, some of us, that you are not being strategic? You are being used by the right, you're being used by a Christian fundamentalist who's mad because there's, um, uh, you know, because women get to choose what they want for their bodies in, in, in Shenzhen. And so, you know, he's being used by the State Department and that is being used against progressives. Instead of the first um, casualty of war is the truth, we're already seeing that, the second casualty of war is human rights. If you really care about the human rights of Uyghurs, you do not want to be going to war in China because you know that when you go to war with someone, we look at, look at what we did to Russia. They have to be oppressive. They have to hold, you know, that anything that they feel vulnerable about is going to be oppressed more, not less. And who the fuck, what's a petition at China in the middle of aggression? I mean, just people aren't thinking. And we, we need to call everyone out and we need to be sisters and brothers to our progressive friends and be teaching because really uh, it's shameful how little we know about China. And so one of the things is a year ago when I launched this campaign was um, to get a team in China to pull together how to make Americans smarter about China. And I'll put it in the, um, in the chat, but there's a new source that's been created and, and it's, um, uh, much appreciated. It's called Dong Cheng News. Um, and you can subscribe and every week get 20 pieces that tell you more about China. Also, do you know that Harvard did a study and they found out that the people in China 
trust their government because it responds to their needs. It Change happens in China. Change doesn't happen in the US. Change actually happens in China. There's like 50,000 protests every year and, and change happens because it's mostly locally about pe what people need. Democracy is local in China, but we, you know, the story is it's an authoritarian government and nothing can change. But who responded the fastest to COVID and protected the most of its people? Do you know that that was done on top of the program that they had created to take everyone out of poverty? That program that was in place to figure out who was poor, who needed support was in place and that is how they were able to so quickly move on COVID. And, you know, are they things that we as individualistic Americans would, you know, smile at? Probably not. But Instead of making decisions about people as individuals, they make decisions about the community as a whole. What is the best thing for us to do as a community to save everyone? Um, so it's a different kind of thinking than we have in the US. Uh, one of our campaigns is around a movie that was made by an investment banker in the US and an award-winning, Emmy award-winning documentary filmmaker because they were curious, like how did China pull everyone out of poverty? They made a film about it. The Chinese didn't get in the middle of it. They let them go anywhere. They didn't affect the edit. So they were not censored by China, but it is now being censored by PBS. Why? Because it makes Beijing look too good. So, um, you know, just saying, um, this, is, this is where we really gonna need everyone's voices. So now is some time for any questions um, while we still have our team. I know that that was a lot to take in, but um, now you're super smart and um, you can be out there sharing all this. It's also going to be recorded and will be sent to you in an email um, if you want to um, refresh. Uh, so any questions? Alex, I see a hand raised. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm First of all, it's I think my first to one of these, so thank you. And um, and and I'm 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 looking for some smartness here, so I really appreciate uh, all this great research. I'm curious how one responds to um, people saying that uh, you know that that uh, Beijing is is clamping down on Hong Kong and the freedoms of Hong Kong, and uh, also about their in the uh, islands in the South China Sea and, uh, and the potential threats to Taiwan. So I just would like to know how to respond to those kind of, uh, th that narrative and those, that framing. Thank you. So Madison kind of told you that those, those are, well, first of all, Hong Kong has been funded by the US um, State Department. And so, um, all that story, what was what was fueled in Hong Kong, and if you're a true person who lives in Hong Kong, you hate the U.S. for what they did to the streets of Hong Kong, because that whole uprising was fueled by the State Department. No was, you know, like everyone knew they were under the government of Hong Kong, and the fact that you have people who were colonized by the British, <laughs> who were living under colonization, complaining about their government's form. You know, it's like, it's kind of crazy already, but to know that there were 2000 CIA agents funded by the US in the streets helping to drum this up. And often you would hear from someone in the Hong Kong, you know, I would hear from friends who had family back in Hong Kong, why is the US doing this? It's making our city unstable. It's, it's, you know, it's, you know, they, a lot of people in Hong Kong saw it as the US destabilizing, stabilizing. And so what we get is the news that the US prints instead of the news that's happening in Hong Kong. Now, you know, it belongs to, it's part of China. It has always been part of China. It was stolen from China by the British. They colonized it and then they had to give it back. If you want the backstory on that, it's ugly and horrible. And it's a, it's a really painful story for Chinese. Um, and Madison just put in there um, the movie uh, Voices on the Frontline, The War on Poverty, but um, they're, uh, they're, they, just so you know, the people in the streets of Hong Kong had American flags and um, pictures of Trump. And so, as she said earlier, this was stirred by the right wing, again, of the US government. Now, um, 
let's just say, you know, things that I say. I believe all governments are pretty fucked up because they have to be a government and it's a mess, you know? So it's not like we trust any government. Every country we've been in, you know, going to war, it's like, we're Americans, you're Iraqis, you know, we're Syrians, you're, Amer you know, it's like, yes, governments are fucked up. So I'm, we're not here to say the Chinese government is perfect or they're, everything they're doing is great. It's like the Chinese government is governing. The US government is governing. Let's pay attention to the human rights abuses of the US government. Let's pay attention to the, you know, infiltrating of other people's way of being by the US government. Let's talk about coups that just happened by the US government. Freaking Bolivia, they threatened the life of the head of a government that was indigenous. You know, so is any of it perfect? No, it's government. It is not perfect. But to then be deciding what should be happening in another country is itself white supremacy, is itself, you know, meddling in something that's working for a lot of people. And it's working for a lot more people than live in America. So, you know, and that's a Harvard study, by the way. But why it's working is um, because people do have choices, because people can affect their lives. And because if you're a Chinese person, you know, in the last 20 years, I think every year your, your life um, capacity went up by like sometimes 10%. You know, it, we're not living in a, we're living in the US in a downward spiral. They're living in an upward spiral. They're not gonna be complaining exactly because they're, you know, it's doing pretty good for them. So, I mean, I, do I agree with the Chinese government about everything? I don't. Um, but the Uyghurs is a fully constructed case by a really horrible right-wing racist who gives a shit about Muslim people, could care less. But it's a, it's a tool to take us to war. Now, you know, the fact that, you know, how do we not be white supremacist? The fact that Muslim countries are looking at what China's doing and grateful, what's happening in Shenzhen, the US created. They talked to the president of the king of Saudi Arabia and asked him to take Wahhabism to Shenzhen because Shenzhen has always been an entry point for 50 years by the US. We've been targeting Xinjin for 50 years. Don't forget the CIA is why the Dalai Lama had to leave Tibet because the CIA had infiltrated Tibet for 20 years and that caused China to push back. So if you think that China is gonna take the CIA and like lay down and roll over, it ain't. It was destroyed by Japan. It was destroyed by Western civil, you know, civilization. It is not gonna roll over and be a good dog. It has had enough. It is gonna take care of its people. It's a lot more people than any, you know, that list of people, you know, that have the biggest militaries, they still don't have as many people as China. So, you know, that's, um, it's, it's not gonna lay down. And you got to see that in Alaska when freaking the diplomat of America sits down at the table and basically says, fuck you, we're the big dog and you need to behave. And China kicked back. And, you know, and China will kick back. I mean, I have a great tweet I keep on my, my desktop. It's from um, the, woman, uh, some, the woman who's the spokesperson for China um, back at Secretary Pompeo. And she says, under the leadership of the CPC, China is the only country in recent decades that has become the world's second largest economy without resorting to warfare, colonialism, or slavery. For more than 10 consecutive years, China's contributed to over 30% of global GDP growth, over 30% of global GDP growth, 850 million people have been lifted out of poverty. China is the second largest contributor to the UN and has sent more than 40,000 UN peacekeeping personnel, outnumbering other permanent members of the Security Council. The CPC enjoys the highest rate of support and satisfaction among Chinese people as over 90%, according to the latest Harvard poll. I mean, you know, it's just, yes, I'm sure there's some shit wrong, but you know, first, my first thing is I'm an anti-war activist. If what you're saying is driving us to war, shut up. All I wanna hear is how do we cooperate? How do we get along? Yes, 
we capitalism and socialism are different, but why can't they both be on the planet? Why have we killed? US has killed 20 million people because they're socialists and communists. That is a crime. That is a, that is a genocide. Because if, if socialism and communism is like a religion, it, like capitalism is, is the US religion, then why do we get to kill people for having another religion is a genocide. That doesn't get talked about. Why can't we let people live in peace with their own values? Um, so yeah, I mean, there's an, uh, uh, oh good, um, Madison, thank you, has put in um, a piece by our partners, the Go Chow Collective on Hong Kong. Um, and, um, and also um, maybe Madison, if you have the gray zone piece on Shenzhen, um, the gray zone piece I'm not as um, excited about is the uh, uh, Chow Collective. The Chow Collective is rigorous and they're thinking the gray zone's a little more outrageous. I think there's some um, percentage. They, I don't think they know math. Um, so <laughs> they're reporters, which who I love. I, yeah, I may love Max and, and, and Ben, Ben who used to be a code pinker. But um, the, the, the facts about um, Zens are all true in the, in the gray zone thing. The real, I think there's some number prop. I mean, I'm not either a mathematician, but I think he didn't know how to figure out percentages, but the facts are true. So, um, but it doesn't matter. It's still, if you care about Hong Kong, if you care about the Uyghurs, you have to stop war with China because in a war, repression is the first thing that somebody has to do to save the rest of their people. And so there's some other tools in the chat um, that can help you be smarter. Because let me tell you, these are all targeted at progressives and the left. And our job is to help our friends not get caught in the quicksand that is being laid for them by the State Department. Thank you very much, Jody, for that. Sorry. Oh, thank you very much. It's very helpful. I I was not aware of the CIA background and all that. And it just reminds me of, of what is it, 53 or 54 in Iran and our involvement in throwing over Mossadegh. You know, it's, it sounds like the, there's a, a scratch in the record. Yep, yep. Any other questions? I can't see hands. Um, Lisa, it looks like maybe you're trying to connect to your audio. Um, there's a there's a reaction thing at the bottom of the page. You could, oh, um, when you go to participants, you could raise your hand. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, so I just want to remind you, we do this once a month. We do it because we love you. We appreciate you. You are the wind in our sails. Thank you so much for all you give to helping Code Pink be here. And. Um, uh, it will be recorded and Maxine will send it to you and all the other peacekeepers. Um, as far as I'm so happy you made your way here. Um, Max, I'll make sure you're, you're getting many more of our messages. Um, know the team is tireless and working for peace. Um, so, and Lisa, did you, you're still connecting so I can't tell. Can you talk Lisa? I don't think your connection's working. Well, grateful peacemakers, may there be peace onward. <laughs> Thanks team. Thanks Maxine for and Sana for holding us together. Thanks Carly and Madison for sharing. Much love. Onward. Thanks to everyone. Nice to meet you. Thank you.